Welcome to the One We're Now broadcast. I'm your host, Darren Goodman. And today we've got an incredible message, some insight that I believe is fitting for the time, especially with the epidemic that's taking place with the coronavirus. Um, many of you have probably been quite perplexed. Uh, some have been bound by fear, just gripped by the uncertainty. So hopefully today we'll be able to address some topics, look at it from a different perspective through the eyes, if you will, of faith and the Word of God and bring some peace and comfort to you. Uh, with that being said, please invite a friend or a family member to join in with you across all the social medias. We will be streaming this live, obviously. And then next, uh, right there on our screen at info at ownchurch.org, send me an email, your prayer request, and we certainly will pray with you, pray for your loved ones or your family or your friends. And um, together, we will see the hand of God move, and more importantly, people will be healed and protected from this virus. That being said, um, I'd like to talk to you today about one of the greatest wars that was raged in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, this would be uh, kind of like, if you will, the, the battle risk. Have you ever played that game? Uh, or Warcraft of the time. Yes, today across the globe, we're concerned about the coronavirus and what that could do. But there was another period of time in history to where it looked very bleak. Matter of fact, it looked like all of humanity would be consumed uh, with plagues and disease. However, God protected his people. So we're going to look at that. And this is the battle between God and Pharaoh. The battle of two uh, opinions, if you will, of two plans for man. And more importantly, the plan of good versus evil, the one that is filled with peace versus one that was filled with rebellion, and the curses came and devastation took place. So with that being said, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7, verse 19. Here's what this passage states. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt over the rivers, the canals, the ponds, and all the pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there was, and there shall be blood throughout the entire land of Egypt, even vessels of wood and vessels of stone. Imagine in one decree, in one moment, Every waterway, every pond, every river, every lake, every cistern of water, if you will, every storage facility of water turned to blood. That right there would be headline news. Then media outlets would go crazy over that happening. And this we see in the Bible as a period of time where rebellion triggered devastation. Now, imagine this. The plagues of Egypt progressed from distraction, where the people of Egypt were distracted, to distress, and then it graduated to death. Isn't it amazing how society has been so distracted with social media, with all the technology and conveniences of our time? Isn't it amazing the distress and, and pressure and stress that people live under every day. Could you imagine what life would be like without all of that chaos? And then obviously we've been seeing in our generation many diseases, different types of viruses and illnesses come and try to plague humanity. The good news is with our modern technology and science, we're able to put together some antidotes, some antiviruses, if you will, medications that have helped us uh, with our health and help ward off different forms of sickness. However, in all of the technology, we cannot protect ourselves from the unseen. We must become a people that relies on the protection of Almighty God. Many countries around the world are turning away from the Bible as a truth. A lot of countries are turning away from the knowledge of God. Matter of fact, 
They fabricated their own humanistic ideas. And in such, they're becoming their own God. Could it be that this is the starting of something or the seed of a rebellion that has graduated into devastation? Is it possible? You know, I don't have all the answers, but God does. But I can also say this. The answers that we do have that we find in the Bible are just as valid, just as concrete, and solid as the ideas of man. I've got a couple of questions. Who was responsible for the plagues, God or Pharaoh? Next, who could have stopped the plague, God or Pharaoh? And third question, what is the cost of disobedience? Think back for a moment. Periods of time in your life to where you knew you were disobedient. Was there a price that you paid? Was there a distress that came into your life? I'm sure many of you have had situations that basically brought in all types of pressure, all types of unforeseen stress. And at the end of the day, the person that was to blame was, you guessed it, you. You made a choice that ended out that harmed you. You took a path that didn't go down the road that you anticipated. Maybe you hung out with friends that you thought were true friends and to come to find out they weren't, they were really your enemies and got you into trouble. See, our choice is powerful. How we utilize our choice and the actions we take is so valid and so important that we make the right choice. And here we see Pharaoh was holding God's people captive. He had enslaved them for 400 to 450 years, some scholars would state. And he refused to let them go. His heart grew hard against God. He was the ruler of his own world and the God of his own world. He was also an idolater. His religion practiced idolatry, even human sacrifice. So he had a hard heart. Look at this, Exodus chapter 7, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. You see that? Exodus 7, 22 states this. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened. And he would not listen to them as the Lord had told Moses. So here we see that he's held up, he's bound in a form of witchcraft or secret arts, uh, sorcery, if you will. And he had pulled together all of his mu mu musicians, not musicians, but mu uh, all of the magicians, all the sorcerers together to try to bring him some understanding. And the only thing that happened was his heart even got harder. Now watch. As I said earlier, who could have stopped the plagues? I believe it was within Pharaoh's power. If he would have repented, if he would have turned from his wicked ways, I believe it would have stayed the plagues. My question would be, what would happen today if our world leaders would just turn and repent? What would happen today if we had righteous men and women ruling and reigning? You know, I'm thankful for presidents and prime ministers and world leaders that come out about their faith in God. You know, they're seated around the globe in various countries, several on different continents, and they give reverence to God. They acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. And these type of leaders we need to pray for. We need to support them, even if we sometimes disagree with them. Let's look at a bigger picture. At least they're declaring the name of our God and the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The 10 plagues that came upon Egypt, look at how they progressed. First, it was the water turned to blood. Next, out of that, frogs. 
Imagine, even frogs won't even live in a swamp full of blood, right? Imagine when the waters receded or the blood receded, um, the stench, the smell had to be so overwhelming across the entire country. And then the next plague was lice. Some say gnats, but, you know, gnats turn into lice. (laughs) And imagine the discomfort. It's progressing, if you can see that. See, the water source has turned to blood. All of a sudden, now you have uh, reptiles crawling out and and, uh, the plague of frogs. Then next, you have lice, so the discomfort of lice, body lice, hair lice, uh, biting and itching. Uh, I would imagine the people of Egypt were almost at this point about to go crazy. And then flies came. And with flies, you know, they set on dead carcasses because the livestock is also starting to die because of no water. And those flies carry germs abroad, sickness, disease. You can see the picture forming. The livestock begins to die. Boils start to raise up on every creature, every living thing. Thunder and hail starts to rain down from the skies. I would imagine the typical Egyptian, the citizen of Egypt was probably scared to death and did not know what to do. They probably assumed the world was coming to an end, and it certainly was as they knew it. Locusts then came in, and everywhere were grasshoppers by the millions. Entire country covered with grasshoppers, eating up whatever vegetation would remain. Last, the skies turn dark. Are you getting the vivid picture of this? Imagine if this were a Hollywood movie and you're sitting in a movie theater and all of a sudden you see all of these curses come upon a people or land and the darkness in the sky, hell and lightning happening. It would be easy to think the world is coming to an end. Through each step, nine different plagues Pharaoh hardened his heart. At any point, he could have stopped it. He could have said, enough is enough. I repent. I bow my knee to you, God, Jehovah, the God of the Israelites. But he refused. See, let me give this to you. There is an incredible price to pay for rebellion. Can you afford it? Exodus 12, verse 13. The blood of the lamb shall be a sign for you on the house where you live. When you see, when I see the blood, the word says, I will pass over you and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. See, the rebellion, I believe, of Pharaoh allowed the curses of the enemy to plunder him. What happens is God removes his protection. God withdraws his protection. And the enemy, Satan, has free access to destroy and to plunder. But God made a promise to Moses. And he told him, if you would go and tell all the families of Israel to go and sacrifice a lamb, the very best lamb that they have, and if they would take the blood and put it over their doorpost. When the spirit of death comes in, it will pass over. Or the angels of death, I believe it states, they would pass over. And there is where we get the holiday of the Passover. It's in reference to the period of time where death came across the land and God's people were saved because of the blood. Isn't it amazing how precious the blood of Jesus is? See, this is a foreshadow of the great sacrifice, the spotless Lamb of God that would be given up for the sins of all. And if we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, sin and death no longer has power over us. Exodus 23, verse 25. Look at this passage. You shall worship the Lord your God, and I will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. See, this is later on. Now they've left Egypt, but they still remember because 
In Egypt was the first time the Israelites had eaten meat. Matter of fact, if you want to study when the first time sickness came into humanity, uh, and you look in the historical part of the Bible, you'll see sickness came when they first started eating meat in Egypt. Before then, the only sickness that took place or devastation was in the garden with Eve, whenever she ate of the fruit. And all mankind fell at that moment because of that sin. And you see, this is the first time now that we're seeing sin or sickness materialize. Before the flood, the flood came. We don't have a record of people being sick. But after the flood, we have this record, and it took place in Egypt. So here they're on the desert now. Some six million people have exited Egypt under the leadership of Moses. Pharaoh finally let them go. And in their trekking across the desert, they're at a point now that they're tired of eating what God provided, which was the manna. They're tired of the quell that he's raining down upon them, or poultry. And now they're recanting about the meat pots back in Egypt. And then God gives them this clear word of protection. And he says, I will bless your bread and your water. What is he saying to them? You will not have the curse anymore of your water turning to blood. I will be with you. I will clean the water for you. I will bless your bread. He's telling them that he's going to protect them. Psalms 91.14 says this, Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. Isn't that important? Now, back in Egypt, what was Moses told to tell the Israelites? Put the blood over the doorposts. And in doing so, the name of the Lord would be upheld. The understanding of the Lord would be upheld. And here we see the same thing in Psalms. Those that love God, he will deliver and protect. Those that know his name, he will love, protect, and deliver. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Look at what Jesus says here. Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and cured every disease and every sickness among the people. Many times people want to know, does God heal people? Well, this was the example of Jesus. Throughout the Gospels, you'll see when Jesus entered into a town, a village, a community, one of the things that he did was heal the sick. Those that were diseased would come out, their loved ones would bring them to the Messiah, and he would heal them. I believe we still have that as our covenant right today. The ability for him to protect us and to heal us. Matthew 10 verse 1 states this, then Jesus summons his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. Do you see that? I cannot even understand why leaders today do not believe God wants to heal. Jesus summons his disciples right here. He gave them authority over unclean spirits and he gave them the anointing to cure sickness and disease with his healing power. Isn't that amazing? Look at what John says, St. John 17, 15. I am not asking, Jesus said, this is before his ascension, I'm not asking you to take them, meaning his followers, out of the world. But I'm asking you to protect them from the evil one. Do you see that? Isn't that amazing? Some Christians are believing to escape and get out of here quick. However, Jesus said, Father, leave them in the world, but protect them. Isn't that amazing? It's time for us as Christians to believe for God's protection. Especially when we're faced with this epidemic of the coronavirus. See, it's never too late to start believing, but this is something we need to practice on a continual basis. 
Let's close with this. Exodus 11, verse 6. Look at what this passage says. Then there will be a loud cry throughout all the land of Egypt. This is talking about the time when the, the death angel, it says, came across the land and the firstborn were, were killed. They were destroyed. And it says, such as has never been or will ever be again. Do you see that? Now let me give this something to you uh, as a nugget. I do not believe that the coronavirus is going to end humanity as we know it. I do not believe this virus has the power to destroy all mankind. The reason I don't believe that is right here. It says, such as has never been, and here's the key, will ever be again. Do you see that? Now, I understand end time events. I understand there's things that will take place. But I'm talking about while the believer is in the earth, while Christians are here in the earth, I do not believe we will be wiped out by a virus. I don't. In conclusion, let me give you a few thoughts. God has given us a promise that the plagues of Egypt will never dissipate or uh, decimate us. He's given us a promise that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can have healing and protection. The coronavirus or any other virus that presents itself will not destroy God's people. We have a greater promise through Jesus Christ and a greater covenant. What we must do is begin to believe. What we must do is walk in faith. We must live according to the word of God. And when we live according to his word, we will have his protection. We will have his healing and we will have his favor. Yeah. I believe God is going to protect you during this time. I do not believe you're to live in fear. I believe you need to allow your hope to increase. And it's time that you and I call upon the name of the Lord. And in doing so, we will be healed. Well, we're out of time for today. Hopefully you've been encouraged. And until we meet again, remember, one word from God can change your life. I'm your host, Darren Goodman. I look forward to seeing you the same time next week.